We are going to begin today with an experiment. You guys ready to be lab rats? It's okay, I'm gonna be a lab rat with you, all right? We're gonna begin with an experiment today. For the next 60 seconds, I want us to sit in silence with our eyes closed, 60 seconds. I'm gonna start a timer starting now. All right, that was 60 seconds. And for some of us in the room, that was the first 60 seconds of silence we've gotten all week. And you're like just about to fall asleep, right? My loud voice just woke you up. Sorry about that. We're going to get to work here. But I want to draw attention to something. Where did your mind go? Right? Were you, were you sitting there like, this is so awkward, right? We're in church. There's people all around me. We're supposed to be hearing a message. Get to the sermon, bro. Or were you, were you, did you re remember something that you had forgotten, right? That deadline at work or some homework that's not finished yet, or you forgot to do something for the kids or your spouse and now anxiety is beginning to well up on you? Or did you go to thoughts of like, what's happening after church? Like, I've got lunch ahead of me and those buffalo wings sound so good, right? Or, or maybe you remembered in the moment, oh no, we're in church. I'm supposed to start thinking about spiritual stuff. I should be praying right now. And so then you're anxious about praying to Jesus, right? Maybe, he, maybe Jason's going to ask me what I thought about. You know what happens? Silence reveals the noise in our minds. It reveals the noise. We have so much racing through our mind. Today, we're going to continue our series, Honed, where we've been talking about the spiritual disciplines. And today we're specifically going to focus on the discipline of silence and solitude. And here's how I define that. Silence and solitude is fasting from all human relationships to be alone with our heavenly father, depending on him for all of our deepest relational needs. Fasting from all human relationships, being alone with our father, depending on him for all of our deepest relational needs needs. And you and I just unearthed the problem. You see all that noise that's in our mind that we just experienced? That doesn't go away when we go into those moments of silence alone with Jesus. In fact, I would argue it intensifies because not only do we have this mind that races and worries and fears and excitement, all of that stuff running through our brain, we also have a very real spiritual enemy. Satan and his buddies, demons, who want nothing more than to make your time with Jesus not profitable. Their objective in your life and in my life is steal, kill, and destroy. They don't want anything good to come of your relationship with God. And so you better believe when we go into these moments of silence and solitude, they're going to be working overtime to distract you, right? It'll go something like this. Hey, your kid's acting up in school. You're a bad parent. Hey, don't forget, you sinned earlier today and you still haven't repented of that. You're still, and you're, you're shameful. You're, you should feel condemned. God doesn't love you. How can he love you with, with, with what you've done? And they're going to be working overtime to say, hey, look over here, look over here. Don't be distracted. Don't follow God. Look over here. So we have the mess in our mind. We have the enemy distracting us. And then frankly, our world just does not allow for moments of silence and solitude. In fact, our culture rallies against that. 
Do we have life where we have responsibility after responsibility, meeting after meeting, work, family, kids, spouse? And these things aren't bad. They're good and God calls us to them. But we have many expectations placed on us. I'm getting anxiety just talking about it, right? You go meeting, 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 meeting. And you get home and the kids need this. And, and there's all of this expectation, wait and need. And maybe you feel that right now. And in the midst of all of this, there's no room for silence and solitude. Getting away from all of those expectations, fasting from relationship and work, to be alone with your heavenly father, to feel the weight of our need for him, to feel the weight of his love for you and to gain clarity and hear his voice. See, we have three things working against us. And so today we're going to look at Jesus and how he had rhythms in his ministry of working, of ministering to people and then getting away to a solitary place to be alone with his heavenly father. And I just want to pause. I know Anytime we talk about spiritual disciplines, there is a level of shame and condemnation that comes in. I get that. And I hope throughout this series, you have not heard, well, I don't read my Bible enough. I only read it five minutes yesterday. I need to get better at that. Well, I I don't know how to pray. I I need to pray longer, pray harder. God's displeased with me because I don't know how to do these things well. I should know by now. Now Jason's going to say, I need to get solitude in there too. Come on. Listen, spiritual disciplines are not about a checklist. They're not about legalism. They're about relationship. It's about coming to God, giving him your heart, hearing his heart for you and for the world. They're not about a checklist, religion, or legalism about relationship. Jesus didn't die and give you a list of honeydews, right? He didn't give us a to-do list. He said, it is finished. Your relationship has been purchased by the blood of Christ. And now for the rest of your life and the rest of eternity, you get to grow in intimacy with God forever. And that's what these spiritual disciplines are helping us do, growing in intimacy with Christ. You see, God doesn't want your behavior. He wants your heart. And behavior will follow, but he wants your heart. He wants your worship. He wants you to to know how much he loves you and experience his love for you. He did not just give you a list of go to church, read the Bible, pray, get away and talk to me. It's not a checklist. This is about relationship. I want us to begin thinking about these, not so much as just disciplines, but as rhythms of relationship. Rhythms of relationship. God wants your heart. So as we lean in today, remember, this is about relating to your father in heaven. And we're going to learn from the master of this, Jesus, right? He is awesome. We're going to be looking at Mark. The book of Mark is amazing. I love it because it's the play-by-play. Just give me the headlines and let's move on. Mark leaves out a lot of details in his book. And I think it's because he cannot wait to get to the cross. He can't wait to get to the end of his book and say, Jesus won, dude, get excited, right? And even though Mark kind of rushes through the story of Jesus' life, he still takes time to point out these moments where Jesus is not rushed, where Jesus takes time away from the noise to be alone with his Father in heaven. That's where we're going today. We're going to pick it up in Mark 1, starting in verse 23. Now, a little bit of context. Jesus has just come to a place called Capernaum. And he goes into the synagogue and he begins teaching. A synagogue is kind of like a a church for Jewish people. It's where they would go and hear teaching from the rabbi. So we got Pastor Jesus here in a church service. Best sermon ever. Let's check it out. Mark 1, 23. Immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Oh, no. No right? Jesus is up there. He's communicating truth, right? People are just getting blown away constantly in the gospels. People keep saying like, wow, he speaks with with such power and such authority. And so they're just getting blown away by truth. And it says immediately there was in the synagogue, a man who's demon possessed or with an unclean spirit. We're about to see a spiritual throwdown, right? Satan and his forces are going to go toe to toe with the son of God. This is awesome. And the man, he's there and he actually engages with Jesus first. 
He cried out, what have you done? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He calls out to Jesus and he's like, what are you doing here, dude? We got a good thing going. Get out of here. I know who you are. And Jesus, but Jesus rebuked him, verse 25, saying, be silent and come out of him. I love that. When Jesus gets to rebuke somebody, I just think of a spiritual throat punch, right? Like soul punching this demon out of this guy. Get out of him. And the unclean spirit's not happy about this. Look at what he does to this guy. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. So this dude is convulsing, he's writhing and he's shrieking. And then he's, this man is set free. Demon is gone. What? And this happens in the middle of a church service, okay? Like, can you imagine today somebody walks in, boom, Jesus' power just releases and, and sets them free from demonic possession. Holy cow. And he comes convulsing and crying out with a loud voice. And understandably so, everybody's sitting there in the service like, what just happened? This is awesome. Look at what they say. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, what is this? Like, what just had a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Now, some scholars will say this, this verse here that says, uh, even the unclean spirits, uh, he commands them and they obey him. Some scholars say that in this specific area, there was a strong hold of the enemy where demonic possession was prevalent. And we're actually going to see later in this passage where Jesus is just setting people free left and right from demonic possession. And so to these people in the church, this man brings hope. It may have been that Satan had a foothold in their community and their loved ones' minds are racked with demonic possession. And with a word, Jesus gives this man clarity of mind, clarity of thought, and the demon leaves him. There's hope. And understandably so, his fame spreads. There, it spreads like wildfire. They're excited. Jesus is here. This is what we've been waiting for. In fact, Jesus then leaves the church service. He leaves the synagogue with his buddy Simon. They go to Simon's mama's house. Simon's mom is sick and Jesus heals her. So now not only does he have power over demons, he's got power over illness too. And his fame continues to spread. Look what happens. This, this city is so jazzed about Jesus. Look at this, verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Okay, as an introvert, let me just be honest. If I'm in Jesus' shoes right now, we're locking the door with a padlock. I'm getting some Chick-fil-A and going to take a nap. That's too many people for me, okay? But Jesus doesn't do that. It says that evening at sundown, they brought him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, right? This begins at sundown. The whole city, the text says, is outside the door. This is an all night ministry endeavor, right? Jesus is with these people, loving and having compassion on them all night, healing people. Look at verse 34. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. They knew him. Finally, this community sees hope. This man, this is the jackpot, right? This demonic stronghold. And think about it. Your, your loved one is terminally ill. And you know, you can bring them to Jesus in this city in this time. And he healed. This brings immense hope to this community. And Jesus spends all night loving them, have compassion on them, healing them. And you'd think, at the end of a successful ministry endeavor, you'd think, okay, Jesus, you deserve some rest, man. Like go eat a big dinner, go lay down and sleep in. We'll keep the masses at bay. Like you've worked really hard tonight. You deserve it. That's not what Jesus does. Next verse. 
And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, but they found, or, and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. Like, Jesus, what are you doing up here in the woods? Like, we're not hippies, okay? Let's get back to the ministry. You got a city of need out there. And Jesus was up away praying to his father. And Jesus responds to them. He said, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. There is something so crucial we need to hear from Jesus' example of silence and solitude in this story. I don't know if you caught it. First blank on your outline, solitude is necessary. And I want to pause again. When I say necessary, I'm not intending to lay a legalistic burden on you. Remember, this is about relationship. You see, solitude, putting it into our calendar should not be a burden. It should be a reprieve from the burdens alone with God. But solitude is necessary. Let's look at it. He gets done with this exhausting ministry endeavor. In his humanity, he had to have been tired. He wakes up very early in the morning. This is important to Jesus. He forgoes sleep for the sake of relationship with his father. Now, I'm not saying that's a recipe that you need to follow. If you stay up for three days to hang out with Jesus, you're probably gonna end up in a hospital, okay? But I am saying it is crucially important to him. And you see this constantly in Jesus' ministry. He has rhythms of working and ministering to people and then getting away for solitude and silence. And it says he goes out to a desolate place. Some translations say a lonely place or a deserted place. This is, some of those have negative connotations in our language, but it just simply means being alone. Again, solitude is fasting from human relationships to depend on your heavenly father for all your deepest needs. And so here we see this picture of Jesus getting away from all the needs, right? The needs haven't gone away. The city is still there. They still need healing. They still need salvation, right? There's still expectations they've placed on Jesus. The needs haven't gone away. The responsibility hasn't gone away. The expectations haven't gone away, but guess what? Jesus has. And so Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. Everyone's looking for you. Why are you out here all alone? And maybe you can relate to that. Everyone's looking for you. Or maybe everyone's looking to you. Your kids, your spouse, people in your workplace, they have responsibilities and expectations placed on you. And I'm not saying those are bad things. God loves families. He loves marriage. But the reality is those things come with responsibility. They come with expectation. Workplaces, school, no matter where you're at in life, I think there's definitely points where we all feel this. Everyone's looking to me. Everyone's looking for me. There's expectations and needs on me. Jesus was one of the most pressed people because of his popularity and his fame. He was thronged by people all the time from all sides. And if we don't, Say, okay, I know there's needs, but I need to get alone with my father so that I can come back to those expectations, those responsibilities, and those needs with clarity, full of God's love for me, understanding he's with me in those moments. You're going to get burnt out and burnt up. And I'm afraid, especially here in the U.S., far too many people wear their burnout as a badge of honor. And I don't see Jesus doing that. You know, I see him with rhythm, rhythms of this all throughout his life. And if the son of God, God incarnate, the creator of the universe, God in the flesh needed moments of silence and solitude in his perfection, you better believe us broken, messed up people who are trying to follow Christ needed tenfold. We need these moments. They're necessary. And it's not a burden to be placed on us, but it is a reprieve from the burdens. It's not about a checklist. 
It's about relationship. And I want you to hear me very carefully with the next thing I say. Solitude, and I would argue, all spiritual disciplines are not about spiritual maturity. Now, before you get the pitchforks and torches, just hear me out. Solitude and spiritual disciplines are not about maturity. They're about intimacy. It's about intimacy with Jesus. And that looks different as a, as a student. When you first come to Christ, intimacy looks different. And it continues to grow throughout your life. But if, if the end result, if your goal is spiritual maturity, it very easily becomes legalism and a checklist mentality because humanity is naturally religious. We want to earn everything. We don't often understand grace. And so, so Jesus says we need these moments, these rhythms of solitude and silence, not to place a burden on us, but because God wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. That means authentic, authentic relationship with him. And guess what? A byproduct of that intimacy, of that authenticity is spiritual maturity. But if our goal is spiritual maturity, guess what it's not? It's not intimacy with Jesus. And as we pursue intimacy in our relationship with Jesus, we will grow. And I'm not saying we're not called to become holy. We are. But holiness is a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus. Solitude is necessary. And I remember the first time I learned this for myself. Um, I was a young husband uh, and father. My wife and I, immediately following marriage, we moved to Spokane, Washington, away from a lot of our family. We were kind of alone, winging it, trying to figure out life together, what oneness meant, all that, like how do we get along and all of that, right? We were up there all alone and we enters a baby. <laughs> we got pregnant with our beautiful firstborn, Emberlyn. And the problem was we didn't know much about parenting and she didn't know much about sleep. And so she had this rhythm in her life, we're talking about rhythms today, of not sleeping. 45 minutes, every 45 minutes, she would wake up throughout the night, about six to eight months in, I am done with this. All right, my wife's going away to military training. It's just me and the kid this weekend, and I've got to survive, and I got to make sure she does. And so I come into the weekend with my battle plan. I'm ready, I'm anticipating a lack of sleep. Friday night comes. And my daughter, she had this crazy bedtime routine, okay? It was very crazy. Um, I'll show you. Please don't share this with anybody else, okay? It's just between you and I. Okay, we're going to keep it a secret. All right, so here's what it was. She liked to be rocked violently, okay? We weren't violent towards her, but she would not sleep without violent rocking. So we were like this, okay? Not joking. In the midst of that, she also wanted her back padded, all right? So now we're doing this thing, Okay? Now picture this, all of this is happening in a rocking chair that's moving pretty good, okay? So I get her to bed, I'm doing this thing, she starts doing the, which tells me, okay, I'm hitting the spot, she's gonna go to sleep. She goes to sleep, I lay her down 45 minutes later, wakes up, we go through the whole thing again, 45 minutes later, 45 minutes later. This happens for five hours. And I am exhausted, right? I've given up on sleep. I'm going to sleep in the chair with the kid. And so I go in there. I get, get her in the chair. We do our routine. We're starting to go to sleep. I'm in that space where it's like right on the verge of sleep. You're kind of awake, that dreamy space. And all of a sudden, out from underneath me goes the chair. And I'm like, I let out a shriek. My daughter lets out a shriek and we both just start crying, right? And it was this moment where the, the needs and the expectations and the responsibilities of being a husband and a father were just so overwhelming for me. And I had no one. I was away from my family. I had nobody to turn to. My wife and I had nobody to turn to but Jesus. And some of the richest moments of intimacy with Christ came after that. As I'd spend hours reading scripture, talking to God, praying to him, I didn't know what was happening at the time, but I can tell you looking back now, you know what my soul cried out for? Silence and solitude. The more pressed we are, the more we need silence and solitude with the Lord. 
And we see this in the life of Jesus. In Matthew 26, Jesus, he's at the, towards the end of his earthly ministry. All right, he's looking towards the cross. He knows what's coming. He knows he's going to die a brutal death. He knows he's going to be mocked and beaten and ridiculed. And let's get a, a picture into how pressed our God was in this moment. This is one of those moments where, yes, Jesus is fully God, and yes, he's fully man. Theologians call that the hypostatic union. There's a $10 word for you, hypostatic union. And this is one of those pictures where we get to see Jesus and his humanity wrestling with the mission that he, the Father, and the Spirit had planned from eternity past. Look at this, Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press. It's where you would press an olive to get the oil out of it. Very fitting because Jesus in this moment is extremely pressed. And he said to his disciples, sit here and go over there and pray while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that was James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled, pressed, responsibility. The mission is ahead of me, sorrowful and troubled. Going on, he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. I love the authenticity of Jesus. Jesus brings his three closest friends together and says, look, here's where my heart state really is right now. He doesn't tell everybody. The other disciples don't get in on this, this moment, but he tells his close friends, I love that Jesus had authentic relationship. And then he goes and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed saying, going a little further. Now we're in silence and solitude. He's away from his buddies. He's alone with Jesus or with, with his father. He says, my father, my father. Remember, solitude and silence are about relationship. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's wrestling with this moment of, I know the cross is ahead of me, right? I know the anguish and the pain and the turmoil that's going to come. I know I'm going to be humiliated before the masses. Think about this for a moment. The creator of the universe, here's what he's wrestling with. The creator of the universe will allow his creation to murder him. What? That's where Jesus is. He's to the point of sweating drops of blood. He's sorrowful. He's troubled. He's pressed. And he goes back to his friends and he tells them, please keep praying for me. And he continually keeps coming back to silence and solitude. Several times he comes back and prays something very similar to this to his father. And, and hear me very carefully. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the Jesus that goes into this garden is wrestling with the mission that he has agreed to, that he has planned with the heavenly father. And the Jesus who leaves this garden has resolved to accomplish it. Look at how he leaves. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See the hours at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. Jesus comes out like a, like a commander, commanding his troops, we're going. He goes into the garden wrestling. He's strengthened by time with his father and he leaves with resolve to complete the mission. And we know the end of the story. Jesus is beat and mocked and flogged and he's hung on a cross and murdered. And the decision to go through with that and submit to the father's will happened in moments of silence and solitude in this garden. It's amazing. When we go into moments of silence and solitude, we can be strengthened by the Father. And in fact, if you're in a season where you feel very pressed, you need more time away with your heavenly Father. I'm not saying be a hermit. We're called to community. I am saying the more pressed you are, the more solitude you need. Because solitude is how we persevere when we're pressed. We see that in Jesus. 
He's pressed. He's, he's sorrowful and troubled. And he comes to his father. And his father strengthens him, nourishes him, and he leaves there with resolve. So I hope you hear that Jesus' ministry was marked by this. But it still leaves the question, how do we actually do this? And so I want to give us some, some tips for practical solitude. Practical solitude. This may be something you've never experienced before. You've never done this before. The first one is deciding on a location. Okay, we see Jesus going up on a mountainside or going to a desolate, lonely place. Find a place away from human relationships. Can't be where the kids are going to come in. Okay, if you've got toddlers, you know you can barely go to the bathroom without somebody knocking on the door. Okay, you've got to fast from those relationships where there's expectation and responsibility to get away with God. For me, Personally, it's mountains. I love the mountains. I love the beach. I love nature. Getting out in God's creation helps me reflect. For you, maybe it's something else. Maybe you have a special room in your house. But get away from responsibilities to be alone with your father. The second piece of practical advice I would give is duration. Decide on how long you're going to do this, right? If you've never done this before, don't say, I'm going to go on a weekend retreat in silence in the mountains. That, that might not go well. It's okay. This is like a muscle. You build it up. And on the back of your outline, I've put together some devotions. And it, it, at the end of every day, there's a little challenge there. It says, spend time alone with God for X minutes. It begins with one and it grows throughout the week. This is a muscle that we can begin to work out and grow. But decide on a duration. If you have a practice of doing this, and maybe you're used to spending hours in prayer with Jesus, maybe it's time to take a day retreat. Go up into the mountains, go to the coast, go for a drive. But challenge yourself to move further in this, not legalistically, but for the sake of relationship. The next one is intention. You see, coming into this moment of solitude with intentionality, we all probably really do have time for God in silence and solitude in our schedules. But do we really use it that way? Every car ride you take can be a moment of silence and solitude with Jesus. And when you get in the car, do you turn on your favorite songs or turn on the talk radio or turn on a podcast first? What if you turned off that and said, before I get to anything else, Jesus, I just want to be with you for a moment. I just want to be with you in silence and solitude. I want, to, I want to hear your love for me. I want to share with you my heart today, what I'm worried about, what I'm excited about. Come into this with intentionality. This is going to require that you, you intentionally take time away. But intentionality is also, hey, maybe you need uh, wisdom about a particular problem or a particular season you're walking through. Get away with God. Be alone with him and ask for clarity. Or maybe there's a passage of scripture you want to see come to fruition in your life. Get away with God. Meditate on that scripture. Martin Luther said, meditation is what warms our heart. Christians, he says, far too often go from study to prayer. And if you go from study to prayer without meditation, you go to prayer with a cold heart. Meditation is lingering longer over God in his word. It's evaluating how does what I just learned, the theological principle, have implications for my life, and then I can pray accordingly. But come to your quiet time. Come to your silence and solitude with intention. And the last one, this is very important for our culture, is eliminate distraction. And here's the number one distractor. This has to stay home. We're addicted to this. I'm addicted to this. It has to stay home. And I mean that. Don't just say, oh, I'll put it on silent and I'll take it with. No. Leave it home. If you're at home, turn it off, put it in your car and put a bouncer at your door. We need to fast from this because it so easily becomes a distraction. And that includes tablets, computers, smartwatches, anything that might have distraction for you. It also means fasting from uh, those relationships in your home. You need to get away from the expectations of your role in your home. 
You need to get away from the expectations of your role at your job. This needs to be a place where you can eliminate all distraction to be alone with your heavenly father, that he might fill you up with his love, with his grace, give you clarity about hearing his voice and encourage you to go back out into your community with vigor and excitement for what he's doing there. I'm going to release to the campus pastors, Jesus loves you and so do I.